Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. In today's video we're going to be making a couple of pumpkins. So what I mean by a couple of pumpkins, I'm going to be using my favorite medium, you could say, which is good old pallet wood. I do definitely love the readily available and ever so, you could say, almost renewable material that is pallet wood. And I've been enjoying and waiting patiently for good old Spooktober or October to be right around the corner. And I know, just like everyone else, I kind of been jumping the gun a little bit and putting up decorations already for Halloween. I don't know what it is. I hit a certain age and just, I love Halloween more and more every year, it seems, as I get older. And uh, I bet I'm not alone in that one as well. But in today's video, I will be making probably a couple, two, maybe three different renditions of some basic DIY pumpkins that you can put outside year after year. I want to have some kind of flat 2D versions that you can lean up against. So if you have a smaller apartment or just a smaller kind of front stoop or front patio, if you will, uh, that way you can utilize those to still have chairs or other decorations out. So I want to have something that's going to be flat paneled. And then I want something that's actually going to be in place of a pumpkin that you can still put a tea light in. That's my preferred two methods. And I've been thinking on it for a while now. So let's kind of put some ideas to paper and very well take some paper ideas and put them to the real world. So follow along and I'll kind of guide you through what's going on in my head and let's just see what happens. All right, so what I have so far is I have taken two different sizes of plank. I have the normal kind of just generic pallet plank width and then I've got something that isn't quite double that, but it is still definitely bigger. And what I plan to do is in my first rendition for the flat version I'm just going to use a few boards and I'm going to cut out a very simplistic design and I'm going to tack on the back side of it so this is something anyone can really do uh, the tools that I'm using so far is I've used a chop saw to square up the edges and I've pulled them apart uh, the pallets themselves with a hammer and just a basic different hand tools to kind of disassemble the pallet and then just to straighten up the ends you can use alternatively a hand saw any kind of tool that you can use, a jigsaw, circular saw, anything to just straighten up the ends just makes your life a lot easier. So nothing too major so far. This point is kind of up to you and your personal taste and what you're going for. I'm going to do some light sanding on this wood just because I prefer that for the look I'm going for, as well as also for the general handling of it. It lessens my chance of getting more splinters than I would rather not have. On that note, I will do a light sand on this board in particular. Reason being is, is I kind of like the look of this board because it kind of reminds me of a uh, zombie skin, if you will. And I think that might make a kind of um, goofy slash kind of more creepy or scary pumpkin that I'm going to come up with for the jack-o'-lantern. And on the note of the jack-o'-lantern, that's what the wider board is for. So I currently have four of these and I'm going to approximate a size to make the box that the light can have, that, like a tea light or even a, a small candle can go into. And that'll be the reusable jack-o'-lantern year after year. You can dress it up, you can paint it, do as you please. And we'll continue from there. But yeah, so far, this is where I'm at. I'm just going to do some light sanding. I'll uh, have you follow along here in a quick second when I do some of the general outlining on it next. <laughs> So, like I said earlier, or just a second ago, all I've done so far is just some light sanding. Main reason being I just want to get splinters off, and it's still 
looks good and rustic. I will say that I'm a firm believer that you can definitely still not be afraid to sand something and still retain that kind of rustic look. I feel a few people get a, a little scared to sand and let me reassure you, feel free to sand away. Just sand within reason so that way it's still something that you can tangibly touch, work with, move, and be decorum without just feeling it has to be Splinter City. I think that's one of the reasons certain people feel very distant from the idea of working with pallet wood or having a rustic theme is because they just feel everything has to be junky or wore down. Not the case whatsoever. You can do a light sand, fully tactile, able to touch, maneuver, make into what I want, and I don't feel like I'm going to get a splinter just by offhandedly touching it or running my hand over it. So, that being said, I'd like to produce maybe mm, two pumpkins out of this if possible. So what I'm going to do, just for the sake of not having to use more material myself, you yourself don't feel you need to do this, I'm going to take this wood and I'm going to make a few cuts the same width of what my backboard is going to be but then I'm going to rip down these to make smaller pieces with my bandsaw. Now alternatively you do not need to necessarily do this you can get, get away with just one of these in the dead center in the back or you can do two one on top one on bottom I just feel for maximizing my material I'm gonna make a cut down the middle so either way be more than happy to do it but like I said, for myself, I'm going to rip one of these in half to be my top and bottom. So what we're going to do now is we'll just kind of line out and play around with our material till we get what we want for a look. And if we want gaps, because a few of these have some curves to them back and forth and uh, are kind of bowed. So you can play with that a bit to get what looks good for the material you have. It's all going to be a little different. That's the beauty of pallet wood is one side might have more character than the other. Some might look all a very drastic, crazy pattern, and you flip it over and it's even more so, or even less. And with that being said, you can definitely play with that. Some of them might have way too much of a bend. This one's got quite a few warbles and twists in it. So what I might use this piece for is, is it twists every so often. So I might make my cuts and use this as my back piece, even though it has a lot of good character to it. I'll kind of play around with it and see exactly. But what we're aiming for is probably, I'm going to go with four boards and I'm going to cut a piece down to be my tops and bottoms for the two pumpkins I'm going to make for the more two-dimensional uh, rather than the three-dimensional um, just decorum for either the walls or if I'm just leaning this up on my deck and decorating around it. So we'll do that for this piece here and do the top and the bottom real quick and I'll kind of make a few cuts and show you what I'm doing after that.
tentatively, this is what you can come up with with just a palm sander or a sanding block and a coping saw. That's actually one of the things I ended up using because I knew the frailty of this sometimes. If you use just a full on jigsaw like I have, you could have used, can sometimes break. And if you're doing anything very much like this scroll work right here, you can use a more gentle blade and you can actually turn a couple of these down for the speed and take your time with it. Otherwise, alternatively, you can use a coping saw like this one. I purchased this from Harbor Freight for $5. I did break a blade. Uh, this is another $3 for a couple different blades and they work fantastic as you can see. The product or end result I think turned out pretty darn cute if you will. <laughs> And I did end up, because this board in particular had a twist in it, same as the back that I used, I ended up actually using a small little scrap I had laying around. So you may end up having to do that. I had also utilized screws in the back, mainly because I was being impatient. So alternatively, what would have been a better way to have done this is make your outline, take each one of the boards, cut those, sand them like I did ultimately, and then mount your backboard to it and you can actually cut out what you need, whether it be two pieces or even just one down the dead center if your material is not quite as twisted as a lot of the boards I used was. And I did just a light sanding so that way it all kind of has the same feel and appeal. I like this darker one and then we have a almost darker and then two lighter ones so that way it kind of breaks up the monotony of it. I did one little leaf instead of a couple, uh, a few different ones I was looking at for inspiration had just a straight notch. You don't have to make it quite as articulate as I did, but I definitely like the overall aesthetic for the two-dimensional version. So now that we have one of those, I don't know for sure if I'll make a second one. Originally I had thoughts of doing so, but I think I want to continue on with the more three-dimensional one next. So we're going to hop over, knock out that three-dimensional one uh, using the wider boards. And all we're going to really do with that is a pretty simple concept. So I'm going to use the wider board and to do two separate boards. And then I'm going to come up with a face I'm going to draw on it and make cuts with that using either the coping saw or this jigsaw here. And the reason we're doing two instead of multiple pieces is depending on how you articulate the face, especially for the mouth, may actually connect the dots essentially and either make the center board very weak or it'll just absolutely fall inward on itself and you'll have to kind of come up with a way to rebrace it. So utilizing two sides and not allowing the face to connect on either side or up and down, you can create whatever face or design you want in between the two boards and it'll be a lot more secure. You'll still have the T-light capability through the inside and I'm just going to kind of guesstimate a good height for this and we're going to make the faceplate first, cut that out, and then we're just going to match the front dimension to the back dimension using the same material we use for the front to the back so that way we don't really have to worry too much about the width of our dimension of our material we come up with because not every palette is the same for width so as long as this front board is the same as the back boards and then you do the same on the sides that way you can kind of cheat past having to get exact dimensions you're just working off the material you have whether that be store-bought or as in this case palette wood so that way we get that kind of rustic look. And on these boards you can see which ones were down versus which side was face up for weather. This is going to be the outside. The lighter material will help with the illumination off of whatever we use, whether it be a candle or just like a faux tea light or an LED. This is going to actually reflect that a lot better versus this darker material. So that way I'm kind of playing up my material for what I have. So outside, inside. But that's the basis for the front backs and sides and I'm just going to match all of them to the exact same height and we're going to make eight pieces essentially. Two for the face and we're going to have the back and then both sides. We don't need to worry about a hole in the back of any kind. We're going to be putting everything from the top just like a normal jack-o-lantern. So we'll do bottom or rather base and top as a last step for right now. Let's get to the face.
All right, so a bit has transpired since the face plates. So let me go through this real quick. When you make your face plate, all I did was two boards. And once I cut out my design and got my desired height of the overall jack-o'-lantern essentially, what I went through from there is I actually nixed a little bit. So one plank, prior connected, cut half essentially, to match the same height as this face. As well as from this piece cut will be the back piece of each of these. So if the width changes, the face will match the rear essentially. So this will become the back and this is the front. And these will be the two sides to that back. So that gives us our total height, whatever they might, that might be essentially, that's how you find your unknown. Now for the face plate, what I did is I took the two sides, added them together. There is some warp and change in the material. I laid it on the board and then I took a remnant or a cut in half board and laid it on there. This gave me my width essentially. So with both sides on, this will be bottom, top, so on and so forth. Now what I plan to do with these pieces is I will have a bottom board that will lay down as such. So as you can see, the material being thinnest this direction and thickest this direction, if that makes it easier. So the reason being for that on the bottom piece is that I can use a longer either nail or I can use a longer screw to get into this material and then I can just use something to anchor this down. So once the box itself is created, it will just sit onto a platform and then a lid will just kind of be its own entity that can then rest on top of it. So this will be kind of like a bag shape and that will be structured in and of itself. And then a base plate will be added, which is these two pieces right here. And then once that is constructed and it is attached to the bottom here, the lid will be constructed. Now for the top of the bag, essentially, or jack-o'-lantern, I will have this strap laying flat and I'll actually lower it about an inch from the top. Reason being is when I construct the lid and these will be attached to it, I'll have a recess. So it doesn't have to quite be down that low, just kind of showing you. So a little bit from the top, half inch or however much this material is, depending on how exact you want to get it. You can be a little bit more loose, go a little bit more like a full inch, give this no way to touch or interact with this. You don't have to sand anything, make it easier on yourself, as long as it doesn't interfere with the face. Now I might get a little closer to the face than the top, reason being, is over time, any moisture or any warping that may happen with the changing of the temperature or changing of humidity. I want to have as much structure near the face since that will have the tendency to like wiggle or kind of warp in one direction or the other. Now this is the interior. The bottom is the actual exterior. The reason being is so I can just get right to mounting this and I don't mess up on that end. Now as for the bottom, what I did, and I'll show you here at the back pieces, is I took back and front, which are the same width, and to show them directional here for you, I laid them on a board, and I gave it about a little over an inch overhang, like inch and a quarter, inch and a half, what looks more pleasing to the eye essentially, because I want the bottom to be a nice stable base, and then the top to be just in a little bit from that. So for the bottom, like I said, inch, inch and a quarter, inch and a half, whatever looks the best for your material, which may change in width. Now as for the top piece here, on those boards, if I overlay it here, you can see that will dip in about a half inch from that. So you don't want to have this so close to the top that you don't really get any defin like definition. So we're kind of going with the outward on the bottom and a little bit towards the top, kind of visual. So this will be the top actually left in this cut off, kind of broke off piece here for some added character. That will go towards the back. This will be the face. And then I was trying to come up with what would look good for the top of this. Each of these boards are a little wobbly. So 
I'm going to cut these to match once this is constructed and mounted to the bottom. These will be cut to shape for what they need to be for the top. I mentioned, so these will go on the underneath and nest into the bag. And then this board has a heck of a warp, but I actually liked it because I put it like a hat. So this will rest on the top. Bring it over here for you. So this, I made just a square, so I just measured and then cut it. So this was a long board. I just took another board, turned it sideways, and made a measurement, cut it, essentially, real quick and easy. So we're going to let that kind of go on the front here. And then I just made a little block cut off, and I sanded it and rounded each of the corners and rounded the top to give you kind of that rounded look. And I'm just going to rest that right on top. And I'll kind of play around with the orientation of it to see which way I like it. And that will just be mounted with a single screw going through the top of that. And this will have four screws mounting it solid. So that will be a great deal of structure kind of holding this together, holding it pressurized down. And then these will be on the other side helping that warp so that way the lid doesn't bow up with this being curved. This little square here. So we're going to kind of have some tension pulling between the two. So I'll do the two straps first, and then I'll mount this on top for aesthetics and look to kind of give more of that pumpkin appeal. So that's the game plan. And like I said, all of these are not set structured measurements of any kind. It's all proportioned. So most anything that I build is going to be based off of proportions. So it looks proportionately well versus what are the actual dimensions they change so much and I can't give you a guaranteed definitive one way or another. And whatever pumpkin design face that you go with or character or anything that you may change or enjoy might be shorter, might be taller. So that kind of makes it subjective on how this will end up playing out for you as well. This is, as you saw, just one of the random faces I kind of went with and changed a few things a little bit just for my own taste. And yeah. So now comes the fun part of the assembly. Now I'll be using pin nails, glue, and also screws to give this the best shot of having the longest life, uh, not only of it being an entity or a, a, like an item, but it will also be the longest time that this will have being outside before any kind of too much weathering or too much damage happens. Uh, the one last thing I forgot to mention is for the bottom here, I will also cut to fit two straps, but on those pieces, since this pumpkin face is going to kind of rest as such, probably a little bit more like right out here with that attached to it, I will be taking this piece and cutting it to fit behind this board and between the backboard. So I'm not really sure what this will be, but that will be a helpful point that also helps hold this together. So I will construct this bag essentially first, and that will give me the ability. This is what the outside will look like. And I'm pretty darn excited with how that turned out versus the inside's a little too bright for my liking. I really like that weathering and darkness as well as the symmetry that was able to happen with that coping saw. Which, as you saw, all I did was make out a design. I drilled a couple holes so the coping saw could go through it and just did everything with the coping saw. You can use it alternatively with a scroll saw or you can do it with a jigsaw. Jigsaw is a little aggressive for my liking for how thin some of these teeth were in the middle here. So I didn't want to chance it. I just stuck with the coping saw. And it honestly went very quick and I had a lot of control over it. I did have one mess or mishap right here. Got my thumb pretty good. But all is fair in building things. <laughs> but yeah. So. I might trim these down just a little bit to give me myself a little bit more breathing room because I did make it a little too exact off of wobbly boards. So I might trim that down a little bit, even if the sides kind of shrink in just slightly. That kind of may, might kind of add to the visual aesthetic. So now on to the fun part of assembly. For the bag, then I'll be doing the base, and then I'll be finishing with the lid. So yeah, hopefully you're following along and enjoying.
super stoked yet again. I know a lot of these projects that end with me being super stoked. Speaking of super stoked, <laughs> I can say that word properly there. How did you all like the uh, intro? Leave a comment down below. Good friend of mine, I believe his channel, correct me if I'm wrong here as well, is Will Play Music for Food. And uh, thank you to him as well very much so for that intro music. I love it. Is awesome and uh, feel free to check out his channel link in the description as well so hopefully you enjoyed this project if you did make sure and hit that like button hit subscribe if you aren't subscribed to the channel it helps out greatly every subscription counts uh, if you can also hit the notification bell so that way you get notifications each and every time a video is uploaded let me know what you think as well in the comments if you will of the jack-o-lantern as well as the pumpkin I just really have fallen in love with this little guy uh, especially now with the stain and oil, uh, this will be able to be hung outside very prominently without any worries for the season. And I'm super stoked about this jack-o'-lantern. My only concern is how to keep him from walking off the porch. <laughs> um, I really enjoy it. Not that I'm in a super bad neighborhood, but I don't know. I put so much time and effort and uh, love into this little guy here that I'm not quite sure how well I will be to just leave him out on the porch in the cold. <laughs> so thank you all so very much again for watching this content. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, feel free to leave that in the comments down below as well. And have yourself a wonderful day.